Hey, good morning. It's Patricia Murphy. It's Tuesday. This is Seattle Now. Wolverines used to live all over the western United States, but they were hunted almost to extinction. None lived in Washington for about a century, but these feisty little creatures are making a comeback here. We got the first wolverine in a trap in March. The wolverine was trying to chew its way out. (laughs) And it was growling. I mean, it sounded like an African lion to me. The Wild's Chris Morgan will tell us more about the return of wolverines in a minute. But first, let's get you caught up. Congressional candidate Lauren Culp says Facebook took down the page for his campaign. Culp shared an email from the tech platform that said the page violated its terms. The email pointed to Facebook's ban on sharing false or misleading information, but didn't say exactly why the page was taken down. Culp supported former President Donald Trump's claim that the 2020 presidential election was fraudulent and said his own loss to Governor Jay Inslee was rigged, too. He's now running against incumbent Dan Newhouse to represent central Washington in the House of Representatives. Striking Starbucks workers in Marysville say the company has ignored staffing issues at the store. Employees walked out Sunday. Yesterday, they notified Starbucks of their intent to vote on a union. The store is one of 175 in the U.S. that have filed with the National Labor Relations Board since December, according to the New York Times. In the meantime, the company has been doing what it can to dissuade the movement, including employee listening sessions with CEO Howard Schultz. And the Space Needle is turning 60, and they want to hear your stories about Seattle's most famous landmark. If you've got a really good story, you could win a death-defying prize. The Needle's roof will be painted galaxy gold to celebrate, and five lucky, or maybe unlucky, winners will win a chance to help lay down some paint. Wolverines are tough critters. They're about the size of a Springer Spaniel, but they can take down animals three or four times that big. They also live in remote, snowy places, which makes them really hard to track. Now, wolverines were once extinct in all of the Pacific states, but some animals from our neighbors in B.C. have made their way down to Washington. Recently, a female with two kits was spotted in Rainier National Park, and that's a huge step for the species recovering. Chris Morgan, host of the Wild podcast, took a trip with a local wolverine researcher to see how these animals are studied. Jocelyn Akins is his guide, a wolverine biologist. She took him to a camera station way up on Mount Rainier to look for evidence of wolverines in the area. Here's Chris. These camera stations are pretty basic looking, but they're actually really ingenious. There are two parts to this setup. One's the camera strapped to a tree, and the other is on another tree directly opposite the camera. What do you call this? This is part of the station. This but what's is the, the run pole. You have this horizontal pole lashed to the tree and coming Mm -hmm. out Mm -hmm. and then the bait is hanging above it and that's the closest an animal can get to the bait is by walking out on this plank it's like a wolverine jungle gym imagine a narrow platform attached to a tree and a piece of bait is hanging above the end of it the wolverine climbs out to the edge of the platform and then raises up on its back legs to get the bait. And as it does, it gives the camera on the tree opposite a chance to get a clear shot of that beautiful chest blaze, the creamy markings unique to every wolverine. As well as photos, Jocelyn also collects hairs for DNA samples. The platform is lined with small metal alligator clips and wire brushes that are positioned to snag a few hairs as the wolverine passes by on the way to the bait. A visit to the hardware store will never feel the same again. Jocelyn takes a close look at the wire brushes and sees a few long, dark hairs. The main thing that's cool, though, is that I can see follicles. So, like, I can see a little bulb on the end. Mm. It's really hard to see, but that's Mm -hmm. the money. Because when you get, like, sort of fuzz, that's, um, it's harder to get DNA out of them. There's a hair sample there. So that's, oh, yeah, that's brownie. That looks pretty wolverine-y to me. This DNA will help Jocelyn to determine which genetic populations of wolverines are recolonizing this area and where they're coming from. 
What led Jocelyn to this icy ridge that was standing on 6,000 feet up Mount Rainier was something that happened back in 2006. After Jocelyn left her job in Yellowstone, she settled down back home in the Pacific Northwest in Hood River, Oregon. It's not the place where you'd expect to find a wolverine, which is why she was so surprised when she heard the news. Researchers from the Native American Yakima Nation had photographed a wolverine just north of where she lived on Mount Adams in the South Cascades. A few wolverines had been documented close to the Canadian border, but that's about 200 miles north of Mount Adams. For a wolverine to come down from Canada, they'd have to traverse countless mountains and rivers. But the biggest challenge is Interstate 90, a six-lane highway that cuts through the middle of Washington State, a near-impossible barrier for any four-legged animal. So where did this Mount Adams wolverine come from? Jocelyn had a lot of questions. So what was this wolverine doing? Was it a disperser? Was there some remnant population that had totally gone undetected? Unlikely, but possible. Uh, was it a male or a female? Uh, and I was just inspired, and I had... I started I approached the Department of Fish and Wildlife and they gave the go ahead and I just started setting cameras but the state wildlife agencies didn't have the budget to look into where this wolverine had come from or if there were more wolverines in the area but Jocelyn wanted answers so in 2008 she started a small non-profit organization the Cascade Carnivore Project to start her own research but she had no funds no equipment and no experience trying to pull something like this together she asked friends and Hood River locals for help. The regional wildlife biologist for the Mount Adams area was really supportive. He lent Jocelyn an old beaten-up snowmobile. I used to just get that thing stuck in ditches and drainages, and I'd just be on my own digging it out. For you know, so One time it took two hours to dig it out. But... <laughs> Jocelyn still owns that beaten-up snowmobile. For 15 months, she travelled the deep backcountry around Mount Adams, setting and checking camera traps, and hoping. Finally, the day came. She popped off the back of a wildlife camera, and there it was, a photo of that mystery southern wolverine. Yeah, I mean, I just totally, like, ho hooted and hollered. I was on my own in the mountains, like, way up at Treeline on the north side of Mount Adams, just totally screaming. <laughs> really, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was just, I, I didn't think we, yeah, I just didn't know if it was going to happen. Jocelyn had confirmed what had been found on the earlier photograph taken by the Yakima Nation. There was indeed a male wolverine in the South Cascades. This single male was a monumental find, but he wouldn't be able to establish a lasting population alone. What was needed were more individuals, and especially females. Even one female would be enough to help Wolverine slowly come back. It marked the start of Jocelyn's new mission. Prove that this male might be able to find a mate. In other words, prove that there was at least one female Wolverine in the area. Back on Mount Rainier, our sweat has turned cold and icy melt waters dripping on us from the fir trees. I'm wearing every layer I brought, but we made it to one single remote camera high up the mountain. Okay, so here's the bait. Oh, look at that. Get the camera out. Just then, Jocelyn pulls half a beaver out of her pack. It is literally half a beaver. <laughs> really gory. So that's there the back is. half. That's the back half. Every couple of months, Jocelyn, or another team member, heads out to each of her sites and puts out new bait. Got to make sure it stays attractive to any passing wolverine that might catch a whiff. I mean, beavers are so fatty. Oh my god! It's just like there's all this subcutaneous fat that is just stinky. Oh, wolverine heaven. Let me tell you, the smell is quite something. Then Jocelyn makes it even worse. She pulls out a vial of this specially made wolverine scent. Not the scent of a wolverine, but the perfect combination of smells to lure in a wolverine. 
It's called the La Froth Roar Mixture. I like to call it a melange. It was, <laughs> it was put together by these a Canadian, a, like a British Columbia and a Washington Wolverine biologist. They came up with it. It's, it's got skunk in it. It's got um, porcupine essence. Uh, I don't know what else is in it, but it's, you'll smell, I'll bring it out. Beaver? Yeah, there's probably some beaver caster in it, yeah. Feels like I'm in some kind of twisted cooking show. She puts on rubber gloves to help avoid bringing the stink home with her, but she can only do so much. My car mechanic calls me beaver lady. <laughs> <laughs> but all of these smells are like raising the bat signal for hungry wolverines. So that's all dialed in. Everything's ready to go with the hair. The snagging devices. We got the bait on the ground, so now we need to hoist it. Okay. And then we'll set the cameras, and then we'll be done. Okay. No, thanks. You have to be patient when looking for wolverines. The years passed by as Jocelyn searched the South Cascades to find an elusive female. When she wasn't in the backcountry on her skis checking on camera traps, she was busy with other things in life. She completed her PhD and started a family with two kids of her own. But she never gave up. Then, in 2016, one of her cameras detected a new wolverine in the area. Could this be the female she'd been hoping for? It would take another two years of searching to know for sure. It was springtime, and Jocelyn was sleeping in her tent on the last night of a research trip just east of Mount Rainier National Park. She was snuggled in a sleeping bag... And then she heard something. She froze. She could hear a sniffing sound close to her tent. She lay there and listened as the animal drew in two deep breaths. The next morning, there were fresh wolverine tracks in the snow, just four feet from the tent where she had hung some socks to dry overnight. Her team checked the camera nearby, and sure enough, a female wolverine. The female wolverine she was looking for all this time had come to her while she slept at night. And we were able to find the den and document that she had two kits. And that was the first, that was the first um, evidence of reproduction of wolverines in the South Cascades in modern times. So, A full decade of work, but Jocelyn had her female. And not just the female. Two young babies as well, two kits. They were about ten weeks old. They named this mother Pepper. They actually ended up locating her natal den site, only the third known den site in the entire state. And genetic analysis from hair and scat revealed something critical, that Pepper and the male wolverine both had the same genetic signature. And that genetic signature was from the North Cascades wolverines. So this strongly suggested these South Cascades wolverines are being recolonized from the north. This was one of the most significant wolverine discoveries in three quarters of a century. The newspaper headline read, Female Wolverine Spotted South of I-90. And it was Jocelyn and the scrappy wildlife organization she founded that had done it. Now Jocelyn knew if there was one female mom with kits in the South Cascades, perhaps there were more. But being a mother wolverine in this environment is hard, and climate change is only making it that much harder. So we haven't talked about snow, but wolverines are really reliant on snow. The females den in late winter by digging a hole right down through the snowpack to the bottom, and that's where they give birth. So when you look around the world, you see wolverines living in places where snow persists into the spring. And as that's changing, that is what's going to probably be a major threat. Wolverines. In addition, wolverines are scavengers, so it really is a life of feast and famine for them. So when they find food, they often cache it, put it in tree wells, the space in the snow under a tree. The cold snow keeps the meat from rotting and hides it from competitors. And you can imagine how critically important that is when you're a mother wolverine that's given birth in the middle of winter... You can't go very far to find food. So if you can cache food near your den, then it's going to make it a lot more likely that you're going to survive and your kits are going to survive. 
Which brings us full circle back to Joni, the mother wolverine who made all that splashy news in 2020. In the wild spaces of Mount Rainier National Park, an exciting discovery, a female wolverine and two babies called Kits. The first wolverine actually within Mount Rainier National Park in 100 years. Remember, Pepper and the male wolverine were found southeast of Mount Rainier, outside the park. By placing cameras in the park beyond the known range of wolverines, Jocelyn had hoped to really show wolverines were on the move and expanding. And it paid off. The arrival of another female with kits was another sign that perhaps a permanent population is being established in the South Cascades, south of Interstate 90. And so for Joni to show up, a female wolverine that was reproducing and right, right in the heart of Mount Rainier was pretty, you know, satisfying, rewarding, very exciting just to <laughs> know that things were happening. Some of Jocelyn's cameras can send an instant notification back to her phone when a wolverine triggers it. Joni kept on showing up on the camera, which meant that this mother wolverine had likely established her territory inside the park. A pretty big deal. Not a, not a bad field study site. No, pretty good. So here we are, in the heart of Mount Rainier National Park, where Joni, this legendary wolverine, now lives. Jocelyn is hoping the camera we're checking today will have some images of her. She opens the camera to see what's there. The camera's operational. Mm-hmm. And so here's a fuzzy Wolverine photo. No way. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> okay. Just one in the middle. Okay. You're, um, just, you're showing me a picture of the North Cascades Wolverine. That is amazing. <laughs> Jocelyn leans in to see which Wolverine it is, clicking through the photos. Hard to see, but... You can see the very its head is is out of the frame. Oh but God, you, yes! See how like unique that chest pattern is. Yes. So that's that Van. That one looks like is like shoulder to shoulder, kind of a yeah, line, shoulder to shoulder. Yeah, and it goes it goes up. It's all it's almost boxy, and so that's Van. So that's the the presumed mate of Joni, and it looks like a trapeze <laughs> artist of some sort. That's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, and you can you can see his balls. Like I can't in that photo, <laughs> but I know that they're there because he's an older male. And so Van, a dominant male and likely father of Joni's kits. And then... We... Okay, so there's Joni. The famed matriarch herself. Jocelyn would recognize her chest blaze anywhere. It's a very special treat on the camera today. And Joni's not alone. Okay, and this one might be hard to tell, but this one is different, and that is one of her kits. At night? Yeah. So we have Joni... One of her kits, the male, Van, and there's also another male on this camera. Four of the five known wolverines Jocelyn has now documented in this area. These few photographs are magical to see, but more than that, when they're added to years of data, they help to really build a picture from the individual wolverines to the population, how they're related, where they're coming from, and the paths they're using to return. And what seems clear is that Joni is now attracting some of those males to the park. I mean, it's been really neat. Like, Mount Rainier is a hard place to work in the winter. It's really hard. It's much harder than our southern sites. Here's another one, December 24th, Christmas Eve. Um, But it's, you know, it's really protected habitat. And so it doesn't surprise me that if you dispersed here from the North Cascades that you would stop here and set up shop. Jocelyn knows it's the tenacity of these creatures that's the biggest factor in their return to the places they used to live. What gives you hope about wolverines right now? Well, it definitely gives me hope that they've made it back to Mount Rainier and these other protected wilderness areas of the South Cascades. Just the fact that they can get across I-90 and that females are getting across I-90 and they're reproducing. They're finding mates and they're having babies and that is hopeful for the persistence of this southern population. The search continues as the wolverine hopscotches from one wild stepping stone to another, slowly repopulating this region. Jocelyn's organization and other partners are now working with a larger genetic data set to figure out if other wolverines have come down to Washington from Canada, and if they might continue to cross I-90 into southern Washington. If they can, it might spell some well-earned good news for the wolverine and its future in the western United States. 
to me, it's such a sign of like wildness just to know that this critter that needs snow, it needs large wild areas, it needs space away from human development, that it still, it's able to find, you know, after being wiped out by fur trapping and predator control programs, it's made its way back. It's a sign that the landscape is, is still healthy and intact. It's a landscape that Jocelyn will always be driven to explore. She takes a moment and looks out over the icy mountains, like she's channeling her inner Wolverine. So I'm so glad we all got to the station and yeah. to be all out here on this epically gorgeous day. I guess we probably gotta get moving. That was Chris Morgan, host of The Wild with Chris Morgan, our sister podcast here at KUOW. If you liked this episode, you can subscribe to The Wild at any podcast app and follow them on Instagram at The Wild Pod. This episode was produced by Matt Martin and edited by Jim Gates. I'm Patricia Murphy. See you tomorrow.